listening to the AT Tapes, a podcast from the Journal of Athletic Training. We're excited to have another episode of the podcast where we interview researchers and clinicians on current topics facing athletic trainers and discuss how we can utilize best practices to improve patient outcomes. My name is Lizzie Hibbard, and I will be your host for this podcast. I'm the program director of the Professional Athletic Training Program and an associate professor at the University of Alabama. My research focuses on shoulder and elbow injury prevention in youth overhead athletes. You can follow me on Twitter at E.E. Hibbard. Before starting on the episode, I wanted to acknowledge that I know this is a very challenging time for athletic trainers, and the experiences of ATs are wide-ranging. We hope that everyone is staying safe and taking care of yourself in whatever way you need. Because of our continuing COVID restrictions, many of us are still recording from our homes. If there's any change in the quality of the audio, it is due to this, and once we're able to return to work, the audio quality will be back to normal. I also wanted to remind you all that content from JAT is open access, meaning it is free of charge to all readers thanks to funding from the National Athletic Trainers Association. Joining us today is Dr. Zachary Winkleman from the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. Dr. Winkleman is interested in creating a patient-centered experience for athletic training and sports medicine services for all. His research interests include telemedicine and tactical athletes. Dr. Winkleman teaches general medical and behavioral health concepts for the athletic training programs, and we're excited to have him here on the podcast today. Welcome to the podcast, Zachary. Thanks for having me. So before we begin the episode today, uh, I'm going to ask Zachary to tell us a little bit about himself. So can you start out by telling us about why you became an athletic trainer? Uh, this is a, uh, I think, a funny story when I look back on it now. Um, I literally got into athletic training in high school. Um, they had an option to not be involved in athletics or PE at my high school if you took the sports medicine class. And I heard it on the announcements in eighth grade before I went to high school and I signed up to take the sports medicine athletic training class and I fell in love with it when I was in high school and um, decided to pursue a career in that. But it really came from I didn't want to be in PE class when I went to high school. So I was trying to find another option that wasn't band or color guard. Uh, That was the other options available. I was like, well, I got to try something. I guess sports medicine class may work for me. And it actually turned out to be a really good decision for my career. Wow, that's a great story. Um, Probably one of the better ones uh, we've had on the podcast, (laughs) how you became an athletic trainer. Um, So obviously it worked out for you. You are um, at a professor at South Carolina, the University of South Carolina. So if you can kind of tell us about your athletic training journey from um, avoiding PE to your current position. (laughs) which is ironic, avoiding PE. Um, Now I talk about health behaviors, but um, so I uh, started out at Texas Lutheran University, which is in Seguin, Texas, go Bulldogs. And uh, I loved my time at uh, that institution. Uh, During that that period, I got to intern with the Detroit Lions um, during a summer internship. Uh, And then from there, I went to Indiana State for my master's and my PhD. So I was there for six years before I came to University of South Carolina, where I'm in my current role as the clinical coordinator for our post-professional program. So um, before we get started talking about your article in the JAT, I want to talk a little bit about telemedicine in general. So telemedicine has sort of become a topic of interest in athletic training, really recently getting a lot of publicity um, because we've had to as a result of COVID. But your interest and research in this area began well before COVID. Um, So can you start out by discussing how you got interested in this topic of telemedicine and why this is an important aspect of healthcare in athletic training? Yeah. um, So uh, when I was in my master's degree at Indiana State, um, I was a graduate assistant athletic trainer for the men's basketball team. And um, we had a really great relationship with our team positions, but they were located about an hour and a half away from our campus. And so for all of our doctor's appointments, um, we had to load up our 15 passenger van uh, with the student athletes and drive to Indianapolis from our campus for the appointment. So it turned into a a long commute. Um, And as a graduate assistant, we often got tasked with doing some of those duties. And so 
Um, from that, I started to say like, there's got to be a better way of connecting us with uh, another person or another provider for us to get some of these appointments done. And then when I was working clinically, it was interesting that um, it wasn't just, it seemed to be that specific experience with the physicians. Um, I had a patient that had uh, athletic pubalgia and had to have surgery in uh, St. Louis. And that required us to take a trip to St. Louis from Indiana back and forth for multiple visits for wound checks after surgery, pre-op checks, uh, full clearance. And it seemed to be something that whenever we needed a specialist or um, a specific provider, we were always having to drive because we didn't have access to those in our kind of rural area that we were at. Um, and then at other times, uh, when I was uh, with the men's basketball team at Indiana State, the issues were really about I was on the road or we were like in Alaska for a basketball tournament and didn't have access to people or um, I was maybe at home in Texas uh, for um, a short break um, over the holidays and my the patients were maybe still on campus and I couldn't connect with them during that time. And so I started to really say there's got to be a better way to this. I just don't know what it is. And so after I finished my master's degree, um, I took a course at uh, Jefferson University in Philadelphia that uh, was a telehealth certi uh, certificate program. And that really got me into figuring out what telemedicine is and how it can be used in healthcare. Um, and from what they had told me there, I was the first athletic trainer that had gone through their program, um, which is an accredited uh, telemedicine program. And it really started to put my interest of how we fit in the bigger healthcare um, realm, but also how athletic training fits into our specific area in athletic training. And so um, I think from those previous experiences of areas where I was frustrated with the drives or scheduling, um, but then also seeing what the bigger picture of telemedicine was from a large hospital system, seeing nurses and dermatologists and all these people and how they can work together through telemedicine. Well, anytime we talk about a topic on here, I usually like to start out by defining the terminology because uh, I think people use words differently or interchangeably and we want to make sure that we're using the correct language as we're communicating, especially with other healthcare professionals too. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more, uh, kind of define telemedicine and some common terms related to telemedicine? Yeah, the, the terminology I think is what uh, people interchange pretty commonly in literature and in conversation. Um, and I think the best way to sum it up is uh, that telehealth is kind of a larger umbrella term. And telehealth is the concept or design of being uh, for health promotion or health behavior. So it's really more about the idea of uh, disease monitoring or encouraging practice of healthy behavior. So like, for example, if you have uh, an app on your phone that encourages you to drink or breathe or um, have water throughout the day, those are really about telehealth, connecting like e-health and mobile apps and really uh, tying health behaviors into technology. Now, specifically, what I focus most of my research and clinical practice on is telemedicine, which is connecting the, the practice and trade of medicine, which we can do as athletic trainers, to that of technology. So it's really more about diagnostics, interventions, uh, rehab, and how we can provide our healthcare uh, delivery skills through uh, technology. Now, under there, there's a subsector, which is like tele-rehab or tele-concussion or tele-stroke. Um, there's tele-everything for every kind of job sector out there. So those are more specific subspecialties of the telemedicine area. And so you may see some of those in the literature, but um, overview of telehealth is the bigger scope. Telemedicine is specifically our diagnostic interventions and then tele-whatever is our subspecialty areas. Well, thanks for defining those terms, and we'll keep that in mind sort of throughout the rest of the, this discussion and then uh, in the future. So your recently published article in JAT evaluates tel the telemedicine experience of athletic trainers and orthopedic physicians um, in patients with musculoskeletal conditions. So can you talk to us a little bit about the rationale for this particular study and where your participants came from? Yeah, so the um, uh, kind of experiences that got me interested in telemedicine kind of really drove this research project. So after I finished my master's at Indiana State, I uh, had decided and was fortunately asked to stay on as a PhD student um, in their department. And so what I did was I transitioned from doing clinical practice to doing research and teaching. Um, and at that time, I said, I want to figure out how to make this work. And so the first year that I was there, I really tried to stay integrated within the, the clinical practice side of the clinic to find out 
are these things just something I experienced? Are these things that other people were experiencing and really just did more of a uh, tell me how work's going, just a casual experience that first year. And, and then I was uh, fortunate enough to submit a, a grant proposal to GLADA um, that funded this study that really kind of explored this idea of could we actually use telemedicine in the clinical setting at a college and university to say, could this actually improve it? And so I actually got to use this convenience sample that I was once part of um, that I knew had a struggle and a need to say, could we design something around this, this issue to fix it after I've removed myself from clinical practice? So um, the athletic trainers in the study um, and the orthopedic physicians had this same barrier um, that was involved that they were individuals that had a long commute um, and had um, a previous history and relationship built already, but still struggled with being able to connect um, due to the distance and scheduling issues. And so the, the participants were um, somewhat eager and somewhat uh, hesitant to the idea of the study to begin with. Um, but what we had heard was, I mean, we can try it out. And I think that's what uh, ex made us start to begin this study and the grant proposal and going through um, looking for solutions rather than just identifying issues again. The participants in the study filled out a theory of planned behavior and technology acceptance model tool um, in the study. So can you tell us a little bit about utilizing theory in the project and also this specific tool and, and applications within this project and, and potentially others as well? When we wrote the, uh, we're coming up with the design for this project, we wanted to be more than um, integrating just telemedicine. We wanted to figure out what was the decision making factors for individuals. Um, and I thought to do that, we needed to do something before and after. And so what we did was a more of a mixed methods design, if you will, um, where we did the theory build hand behavior and the technology acceptance model tool prior to any um, discussions, education, anything related to the study. So we sent the, the tool out uh, via survey to all of our participants and asked them, just tell us what you think about um, technology. So there, the technology acceptance model is has several questions that um, ask people about their behaviors or intentions to use uh, technology in their daily life. Now, the theory of plain behavior tells you about when you're making decisions to do things during your day, daily life, um, work life, whatever it may be, how you make those decisions and what uh, kind of is your driving factor of force to make those things. So we felt that using some of these theories or concepts would really help us to understand what makes people uh, choose or not choose to use telemedicine um, and using that as a, a pre a factor for our, our study. Um, and so the tools have been um, each designed separately uh, and used throughout um, a psychology literature for a long period of time. What more recently is they've actually combined these tools to make a theory of plain behavior and technology acceptance model tool that's combined is what in which what you use for this study that really helped us to understand how um, technology itself influences plain behaviors and how telemedicine influences those on the bigger scheme. So the tool itself has been um, uh, reviewed and tried in many different settings relative to uh, workers in office settings getting new apps or computers in their workplace um, to other healthcare providers using telemedicine or EMR systems and things like that. So we really thought this could be a good way to figure out what we can do if we have people that choose not to use it in the future. So all of the results are posted um, in the article on JAT, which is linked in the episode notes. Um, so you don't have to go over all of the results, but if you can sort of give us a, a, a summary of them, um, really talking about the level of use and acceptance of telemedicine among the participants. The, the study lasted, I would say about six months in total. So we, we started it in July um, and then in that period is when they did their, their theory tools. And then the first thing we did was actually train and educate everybody on telemedicine. So we felt that everyone needed to be um, set in, uh, make sure that they, they knew what they were doing. And I trained everyone through that process. And I'm sharing this now to make sure that when I share the results, they understand that everyone was least trained and um, uh, exposed to telemedicine. Now, once that happened, we 
allowed them to do normal clinical practice for the next five months of the semester. And so they worked um, as clinicians doing their normal daily jobs. And we sent weekly check-ins, seeing how many people were using it, how many patient encounters were happening, um, and then followed up at the very end with a qualitative interview to ask them about those experiences. Well, the first question we asked was, did you use it? And tell us more about those and kind of went through, did you use it? Well, from that, we found that out of the 22 people in the study, 14 um, identified as adopters or people that used it some at some point in some capacity. And then eight people were classified as non-adopters, people that still told us about their experience or discussions that they may have had around it, but they chose not to actually integrate it into their clinical practice. Um, which was really interesting as uh, seeing as in the bigger scope, 72% uh, of the people in the study actually had not used telemedicine before. So it was interesting to see that 14 out of the 22 still tried it out, used it at some point, even though they hadn't um, known anything about it or used it previous to the study. And so um, from there, we were able to check or track their uh, theory be plan behavior tool that we did at the beginning. Um, and that was some of our most interesting data and kind of rich data, I thought, um, in terms of how we see people in their decision making to use telemedicine. Uh, from that, we found that for the adopters, um, they all had um, pretty relative um, positive answers for the tool, all except for one area, which was subjective norms. Now, our non-adopters had no positive area. So the eight people that chose not to adopt from the qualitative interviews matched up directly to their theory plan behavior, where they told us, beginning, I'm not going to use it. And at the end, they didn't use it. Um, and that data matched up perfectly. Now, the individuals that were adopters, their data on one area, the subjective norms, was uh, lower. Subjective no norms is this idea for the, the theory that um, the people around you, your work colleagues, the individuals that you interact with, really influence the decision of others and how the social norms of your organization, how people talk about uh, topics or new things that are integrated in, change people's decisions. So it's interesting uh, for us that this finding really uh, influenced people's decisions as we had two positions that were adopters, two that were non-adopters. Uh, we had people in the admin role for the clinic that were adopters and non-adopters. So regardless, this was the area that people felt that I got to do what I think my boss wants, or I got to do what I think the physicians want um, from the bigger scope of the study. Um, and then the second part was our qualitative interviews. So we spent uh, quite a bit of time talking to these individuals, uh, learning more about their specific experiences um, over the past uh, five, six months of the study. And what we found was that they really uh, described some challenges with uh, buy-in, um, some, uh, some issues with uh, technology. But from the other side, they were really talking about a collaborative practice, their healthcare providers the, being the supervising physician, actually watching them clinically practice, because a lot of them shared that my physician doesn't get to watch me except for game day, and it's a whole different world. So um, the experience of connecting the physician and the athletic trainer together um, was something that came up through collaborative practice often. And really the idea that um, the technology itself, the telemedicine, really changed the ease of scheduling and the preferences of the patients too, that um, the individuals, uh, I remember one shared specifically about having a uh, international student athlete um, on their team and how the telemedicine made the international student athlete feel a bit more comfortable rather than going to the office and feeling like the athletic trainer or the physician were just talking for them the whole time, that they felt that they were more empowered in control of that appointment. So it was really interesting to hear all of the specific experiences for those that were adopters or non-adopters. Um, uh, the non-adopters shared things that like, I can't touch people. Like, how am I supposed to do my job when I can't touch someone? Um, versus the adopters shared, you know, it was cool to figure out ways to go about doing this exam and figure out a way to actually make a diagnosis or return someone to play even without them being there. So it was interesting seeing how people all in the same level playing field had a very different experience. And we really think it had to come back down to that kind of theory, that, that planned behavior about technology's use in their clinical practice. And I would encourage everyone, if you haven't read the article, to read it because some of those experiences and things that you shared or you all shared in the discussion were really interesting just to think about sort of 
on your own beliefs as an athletic trainer or your own experiences, you know, would that be a barrier for me or an opportunity? Because like you said, everybody has these different uh, approaches, the same situation very differently. So although this study was not related to COVID, um, it is the world that we're living in right now. And, and um, it kind of comes into every conversation. And so I think a lot of people right now are trying to figure out telemedicine and how to best do this or how it could fit into their practice or delivering care to athletes when they can't see them or but, um, because of restrictions. So can you talk a little bit about how the results of this study could be utilized to enhance the patient and clinician experience with telemedicine as we're continually adapting to restrictions or limitations due to COVID? I think that's a, a wonderful question. And I think the, the study that we did with this uh, is only one facet of telemedicine. And so uh, to kind of give you a framework or put this in perspective for the listener is that uh, for this, the patient and the athletic trainer were still together. They were then connecting to the physician through telemedicine. And so they were using this to collaborate with the the specialist, the orthopedic physician. So what we're dealing with now in COVID is that the athletic trainer and the patient may not be able to be connected and that we have to reconsider that the results from this study really describe the experience as provider to provider rather than provider to patient. But that doesn't mean we can't do it. And I think that's what a lot of my uh, work that I've been uh, doing after this project was, is how do we teach and how do we get people on the same level of uh, providing patient care as an athletic trainer through telemedicine. Um, and I think with COVID, uh, I have been contacted numerously over the past couple of months about uh, how do we do this? Can you please help? And um, I think some of the big things here are considering privacy and security and how we can do this appropriately. But for me, it's about how do we make this a long-term integration into our practice? Um, I say it every time I talk about telemedicine is that I don't want to return our profession into robots. And I make sure that people know that, that I'm not trying to replace athletic trainers with uh, a TV screen in their clinic. You have to have a trained clinician to be able to do telemedicine. And so the value of an athletic trainer does not go away ever with telemedicine. It just supplements the care that we can provide. And I think if we look at telemedicine as a long-term solution for um, holidays, breaks, um, for people that are um, have... Uh, narcotics or opioids that they just took after surgery, or uh, maybe they have a concussion and shouldn't be driving. Those people that maybe shouldn't get behind of a wheel, maybe they could get on telemedicine and not get it behind in a car and then travel to a clinic uh, to come see you. So I think there's some avenues and ways that we can explore and continue to adapt um, how we use kind of the results of this study over the long term. Now, if we take the theory of plain behavior, in the technology acceptance model, it's about exploring this with our patients, the parents for our minors, um, athletic directors and coaches to get buy-in from them to really share that, hey, this is a positive thing for us. Um, maybe it's the healthcare executive that runs the hospital for your physician practice athletic trainers that um, we have to see that this isn't just a college and high school traditional setting. This is the military. This is the physician practice that it can be integrated anywhere. But we really got to have that conversation before anybody gets started to say, like, how do we feel about doing this? What are some concerns? How do we get everybody on the same page? And what training or things do you need to experience before we get started to make sure that the, this is a positive experience for you, a beneficial experience for the patient and something that improves our efficiency improves our outcomes for everybody involved. Um, and so to me, I think, I, I hope I don't see telemedicine go away after we've seen such a big uh, influx of it uh, during COVID. Um, we did a, a additional project um, on COVID or telemedicine use during COVID. And we found that 40% of athletic trainers have started to use telemedicine during that time. And so we have to say, how do we keep growing that number rather than we see that number drop off um, during this time too. I think it will be a great opportunity for us to continue to get better at delivering care and delivering telemedicine more effectively. You know, right now, a lot of people jumped into it because they had to, but, um, you know, maybe we can start doing more continuing ed and learning more about how to make those visits the most effective they can be. So you kind of mentioned this already, and, and I'm sure with COVID and telemedicine, you've got a lot um, on your plate uh, or, or a lot uh, on your plate of projects to do or that you want to do. But can you talk a little bit about some of your upcoming projects or kind of where your research is going to go from here? 
Uh, yes, yeah, so the, after we finished this study, this was the first one on my kind of PhD journey, if you will, um, as I uh, started to do re research on telemedicine, um, was we started to explore that um, individuals in this project had no background experience. And so I think for me, and very similar to what you described with professional development and continuing ed was, um, we need to do that for our practicing clinicians, but we also need to start integrating this into our curriculum for professional AT programs that um, I remember one of my uh, classes I had during my PhD, uh, we were talking about uh, jobs within engineering and technology, and it was a really interesting point that they were like, we have to train people for jobs that don't yet exist. And the concept of that in what we're doing as healthcare providers is really challenging. Like we don't know what the world's gonna look like, say tomorrow, right now with COVID, but also with five years down the road. Um, but if we start to integrate some of these new skills or techniques that other providers and other professions are using and say, I don't know if you're gonna use this, but I want you to be prepared for it in case you need to use it uh, in the event that there's a, a hurricane, uh, pandemic, whatever's coming up in our world, um, that you're ready to use it. And I think that's some of the things I want to continue to emphasize um, it, through professional development um, and continuing education for our practicing clinicians and creating research around that, like what makes this effective? How do we get people involved in, in doing that? Um, and that's been some of the more recent projects which will be coming out about it, kind of advancing that for those clinicians about um, what are your concerns for users and non-users of telemedicine um, and then from that, what are some of the things that we really need to know about those experiences so we can help to find the professional development that meets those needs uh, for our entire profession rather than a singular uh, clinic. Um, so those are kind of the projects I'm working on and with my, my research team on the telemedicine uh, aspect and hoping to share that with people so we can start having this discussion on, on a bigger stage and get more people involved with it. I think it's a, an exciting time for healthcare and, and both related to making care better for the athletes that we already serve and access to care for those that we don't serve yet. So as we're finishing up the episode today, can you give us a few take home points and, and really about how this research or your overall research um, can relate to improving patient care and patient outcomes? Yeah, I would love to. The kind of bigger uh, mantra of my, my healthcare system and delivery that I try to emphasize is patient-centered care, that we should be working to make the, a shared decision-making process for everyone, that um, this study helped us to see that the physician and the athletic trainer could be really good at their jobs, but it may not be the experience that the patient, that um, through some of the interviews, we found that the patients were telling people, like, the scheduling was so much easier, I didn't have to miss class, that uh, telemedicine really builds into that patient-centered care mindset about access to care, continuity, meeting the preferences and needs of those individuals. And we have to see that technology and telemedicine integration really aligns with patient-centered care. And that for our profession, if we start to build that in the same mindset that telemedicine is not just um, another fad or another uh, technology thing I've got to learn and try to use on my computer, that it's really about a healthcare delivery system or service that's patient-centered. Uh, I think we start to look at telemedicine more as a long-term solution rather than a, a short-term fix um, for COVID or whatever that experience may have been for someone. So I encourage everyone to uh, take some time to talk with a colleague or work with someone around you and say, I don't know what this is at all. And you may hate technology, you may hate using your phone, um, but say like, maybe this will work and uh, explore your own limitations to say, how can I make the experience for the patient better rather than just say, I don't want to do it because I don't like it. Well, thank you so much for the work that you guys are doing in this area. As we've discussed, it's definitely going to be a big topic, well, currently, but also in the future. And as we think about ourselves as healthcare professionals and trying to um, increase our access to all patients. So thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing your work in the future. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I hope you all found this podcast informative and that you can utilize the clinical recommendations to improve patient care and expand your delivery methods in uh, delivering patient care. So that's it for today's AT Tapes, and I hope you're able to join us on next month's episode. Please remember to rate and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. 
Also, please follow the Journal of Athletic Training on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at J-A-T underscore N-A-T-A on all three platforms. Have a great day. Thank you.